David Goggins needs no introduction. Super impressive. And I think one of the many important things that David stands for is the ability to override limbic friction. Let's say you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. You just don't. Maybe you're tired, but maybe you're just not motivated and you force yourself to get up. What you're doing is you're using top-down control to say, oh, the fatigue I feel, I'm going to override that fatigue. That is top-down control. And what they've, what he's done, if I may, I don't, I've never, uh, I've never actually figured this out conclusively, but I have a strong sense that what he's done is he's somehow gotten very familiar with the narrative of friction or the experience of friction and the narrative of overriding friction. And he knows that a win is coming later. And so what happens is if you know that that overriding limbic friction is going to create a win down the line, that win could be a sense of accomplishment. And what you can do is you can start to thread back that dopamine from the future to the idea by getting out of bed, I'm already starting to experience the win. You can anticipate the win. Now there's actually a paper that was just published on this as a good timing for this question, which is that really points to the fact that delayed gratification is controlled by dopamine. And it's a somewhat complex paper, so I don't, I don't want to get into the details, but what it shows is that if you know that by delaying gratification, you are going to, um, it's worthwhile, you start to achieve that dopamine increase earlier. So delayed gratification is, as it sounds, is, you know, resisting the, uh, the urge, resisting the chocolate bar or resisting the staying in bed or whatever it happens to be. But that itself can start to evoke dopamine release. Now, I'm not David Goggins, obviously, I never will be, but the way he describes his process is a little bit different, I think, than, um, than just pure like, oh, I feel great doing it. He talks a lot of times about how it's very, very challenging for him. But when you talk to people who are very good at overriding limbic friction, you start to get the sense that even if it's very challenging for them to do, that they understand the great reward that's going to come to, that's going to come later. And I think for a lot of people, the challenge is they don't, they haven't experienced or they can't see the win and, and experience the win. And so it's very hard for them to override limbic friction. And I'm not talking about limbic friction as this mild little thing. Limbic friction is a, is a, it's like a booming voice throughout your brain and body of stay in bed, sleep is important. I heard on the podcast, sleep is important, stay in bed. And to override that requires an immense amount of what we call willpower, but willpower is top-down control. Mm. I mean, if you could get all your sustenance without having to venture out too far, why would you go any further? Now, the evolution, the forward evolution of culture in our species and individuals has been created by people that were willing to push out further and further. I mean, right now we talk a lot about uh, Elon, right? He's the one that's sort of like, well, why limit yourself to Earth? <laughs> you know, which is a cool concept. Um, but this exists in every domain, as you know. Uh, Rich Roll, our good friend. You know, anytime we overcome uh, doubt, challenge, uh, internal doubt and challenge, we're engaging these mechanisms. It's a skill and there's neuroplasticity in this circuit. That's the thing that's often not discussed is that the ability to focus is enhanced by forcing yourself to focus. The ability to sleep is enhanced by getting better at relaxing and turning off thoughts. And the ability to override limbic friction can only be created one of two ways. One is to increase your overall levels of alertness through dopamine and norepinephrine. That's why people take Adderall and Ritalin, drink caffeine, smoke nicotine in order to get more alert. They're trying to, they're biologically hacking their way into the system. I think it's beautiful when people can psychologically, I always say, I always imagine scruffing myself, you know, like you'd scruff an animal or you'd scruff, scruff you scruffing myself and forcing myself into it. And sometimes we, we have this narrative that's so closely tied to our immediate state that we have a hard time forcing ourselves into some other mode of action. And so it can be very helpful to take on a view of yourself that's living in anticipation of the future state that you're going to be in like successfully getting out of bed in the morning. I did this this, I, this morning. Um, we just, I, last night I said, let's, um, my partner, I said, Let, let's go jump in the ocean tomorrow morning. We got up and it was raining, it kind of like the smallest matter. Very but, misty today. And I was like, oh God, it's going to be cold. And then we're driving down there and I didn't tell her because I, I, <laughs> I didn't want her to know what I was thinking. I hate getting in the ocean when it's cold. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. But then we got there and actually the water was just a little bit warmer than the external environment. Mm. It was beautiful. We had good. the best, the best ocean dip in the morning. And then I saw it afterwards and it was, it was wonderful. I've been feeling great all day as a consequence, but you know, it took a little bit of override. That's a mild recreational example, but I think that 
If we can start to see these reward systems and top-down control as things that we can modulate in real time you, and use it sparingly. I'm not suggesting people do this for everything, right? It can be very exhausting to scruff yourself into the best action all the time. But look, I mean, people who are recovering from addiction, they, they have to do this. It's a, it's a process from morning till night.